We are back with Vanguard and it's going to be another opportunity for me to misuse their trolleys, which are, by the way, excellent, sturdy trolleys. It's going to be a quick test today and it's going to be about torsional strength or the ability to resist uh, bending from an off-axis angle. And I'm not going to be playing around with uh, Enegra or Kevlar or this is an Enegra Kevlar uh, sandwich. Instead, I've actually just gone with some basic glass fiber because I have a, uh, a plethora of unnecessary glass fiber now that I'm not doing so much work on Alan because glass fiber on Alan didn't really matter because he was heavy and glass fiber is dense. Anyway, the plan is I've made these three sheets. So this one has two ply of glass fiber um, at zero and 90 degrees. Both of the plies are at the same orientation. This one here is a mix. So there is one ply uh, uh, at uh, zero and 90 degrees and so standard woven uh, glass fiber and then the other one is at 45 degrees so that half of the weaves are going in that direction and half are going in that direction so you'll end up with something which they call quasi isotropic which basically means that you're getting something closer to uh, materials like metals which is why the majority of sheets of metal for instance don't have any more stiffness in one direction than they might in another i'm sure there are some examples where that's not the case but it's a, it's a fairly standard rule anyhow so this is the one that's uh, giving us some hopefully more torsional uh, resistance and then this one i've kept one sheet of 0 and 90 so just one normal sheet of uh, plain weave and then I've used exactly the same amount of glass fiber that I would have used in the second ply But I've turned it into a ladder shape. So there are thicker strips along here and along here 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 and here So it's much thicker in these zones and then in the gaps in between It's just one single ply of 0 and 90 and that's going to give us something more like a ladder chassis So it's going to be reinforced along the edges and across the struts and then it's going to be much, much weaker in the middle. None of them are at 45 degrees. And so we're going to see which of these three has the best torsional resistance to being essentially pulled down in the corners. And of course, I'll also test the center, which will just be a normal bend. Let's see what happens. I was going to unleash some more of my legendary motion graphics upon you, but here's an easier, lazier visualization of the three layups. The mix of straight and 45 degree, the pair of straight layers, and then the ladder a sheet underneath and the upper sheet cut into struts along and across. I've not included 45 degree angled reinforcements here. This is my system. Each sheet is clamped together strongly to the trolleys in consistent spots. Then I hang a hand clamp on both corners to see how the sheet deals with twisting and also one in the middle just to see how it bends linearly. I did this in all four orientations for each sheet and took the average and this is what we got. Zero and 90. The edge is nearly 300 millimeters off the floor when just sat there doing its thing being a sheet. But then the straight bend test in the middle. It flexes a lot and is barely 260 millimeters off the ground. This isn't that surprising since only half of the fibers in each of the two plies are resisting this force. When weighted down at the corners, trying to twist the sheet, those corners drop down quite a bit further than the bend in the middle. No major surprise and there's no strategy in this sheet to resist torsion. Next, the 45 and minus 45, where there's one ply at 0 and 90 and then the other at a quartering angle. This is the sort of layup that people would normally choose for a quasi-isotropic shell or monocoque. They might even put more layers at 22 and 67 degrees and so on. But this is all still a 2D thing, not the 3D uniformity in behavior you get from true isotropy. The same unweighted behavior. When bent in the middle, it's a lot more resistant, stiffer, higher modulus, whatever term you prefer. This is because only about a quarter of the fibers are making zero effort to resist the weight. And then the torsion. Floppier than the normal bend for sure, but still better than the zero and 90. Okay, so the laws of physics have not confounded us so far, even though composites and their hybrid weirdness do often try. Finally, to what I call the ladder. One ply of zero and 90, and then having created a sort of beam structure using strips of the other ply. This is a bit like an old school chassis, but not entirely as there's still a shell of sorts. This is a tiny bit floppier at rest, but nothing to note. When weighted in the middle, it's kind of like the zero and 90 sheet. Then when under torsion, a surprise of sorts to me. It's the most resistant, although only by a bit. None of those fibers are orientated at 45 degrees. So is modern wisdom that you'd use a quasi-isotropic shell in preference to a ladder chassis for torsional stiffness nonsense? Not really. The 45 degree one still wins the bend test and these sheets are not a 3D shell. Finally, this, the weights. The first two ones weigh exactly 140 grams, but the ladder one is over 35 grams heavier. This is due to the layup challenges, it's extra resin. If you infused, used prepreg, or were just a better composites artiste than I, you'd maybe improve on this, but for certain, unnecessary resin is catching a free ride here with the added surface area. 
Are the explanations for the behavior? Thickness. Of course, this third sheet is about three times the thickness at the thickest points compared to the other two. Thickness, as well as the behavior of fibers in the resin matrix, decides what a part will do under stress. I mulled over the lessons here for Bernard's main structure as I did an overdue tidying session at the warehouse. We will need each part of the shell, and it will be a shell, to have fibers running in at least four orientations. Fine, but I'm also interested in having some zones of the shell with more or fewer fibers and perhaps even different types. Perhaps where the wheel mounts are to be, and when we need to bolt through solid laminate without foam core. Also, perhaps a more flexible zone where impacts are likely. With that in mind, a second little experiment with two aims. I'm also going to do another test, and you may well think that just looking at these two pieces of black composite, both the same thickness and I think almost exactly the same weight, you may think, well, what's the difference? Well, the answer is they have been set in different sorts of resins. There's carbon fibre, of course, as the reinforcement, but one of them is standard epoxy resin. The other one, which has been set in a flexible polyurethane casting resin, which I gather from those at Easy Composites, where I got these from, uh, you can set uh, reinforcements in these like carbon fiber and other sort of composite fabrics to change their properties even though this is officially a casting resin it is the stiffest in this particular range um, but it's not a completely sort of solid um, cast, casting resin it's still kind of a long elongation to break and I'll show you some of those details in a second and the effect that it actually has on the composite the reason I'm doing this is because I'm wondering whether there are some applications within the Burnet project it could actually be superior to using epoxy resin because it's got that longer elongation to break because even though epoxy resin can flex quite a bit we're talking seven eight maybe up to ten percent um, but with this you can get well over its own length the elongation before it starts to pull apart anyway Bit of an experiment, we'll see what happens. I'm doing a simple bending test on a whole load of sheets of various composites with different thicknesses. The second aim is to see what on earth happens to the polyurethane infused carbon fiber, but the first is to ascertain how much stretchy slash floppy fiber, such as the polyester in dialin or the polypropylene in Enegra, is required to give an equivalent stiffness to a given thickness of carbon fiber. Again, this will see an interaction between each fiber matrix characteristic and the simpler factor of thickness. To explain what I mean, you can get the same stiffness from two sheets of stiff 200 GSM carbon fiber and from two 200 GSM sheets of wildly floppy Enegra. How? By increasing the distance between the two sheets of Enegra around a core. But this isn't a good idea. Aside from taking up lots of space, all of the other strength ratings would be very poor, a fragile part. But in a solid part without a core, we might be able to use a thick section of impact resistant floppy fabric in a crumple zone where crack prone carbon fiber may prove too vulnerable. It does need to have an equivalent stiffness so as not to ruin the monocoque. There will be a weight penalty in terms of more resin, even though dialin and anegra are less dense than carbon. It's another simple test. Four measurements of the sheets, both ways up and each way round, in a straight bend, observing the distance from the ground. Only one totally failed. One ply of anegra is just very flexible. It bowed out of the test and went off to amuse itself elsewhere. We also included some fiberglass too. Normal E-glass, S-glass, which has a substantial YouTube fan club, and super cheapy chop strand mat. And of course, my otherwise identical carbon sheets I showed you before of epoxy versus polyurethane resin. These are the results. And this graph isn't wildly helpful, save to show a little variation in the initial unweighted flexibility. Some bend a little merely under their own weight. So, worth including, but this one is more useful. It shows the amount of, let's call it, droop, caused by the silicon rubber weight. I use silicon to stop it falling off the slidey plates. Dial in first. For those unaware, this is a low-cost, low-density polyester that's good at improving impact protection. It's like Kevlar, but stretchier, cheaper, and weaker. The thin 38 gram one has very little stiffness, although that improves a great deal when another ply of fabric is added. If you use four plies, two either side of a 3mm foam core, you get zero deflection with the rubber weight added, but it's the core doing the work there. Next to some carbon fibre. Low deflection, but at only three plies with no need for a core, you have nearly no bending. Whilst glass fibre isn't really used for anything weight critical, we can enter them into the mix here for reasons of pure adrenaline. E-glass is what most boats and so on are made of. It deflects more than twice as much as the carbon. S-Glass is a premium version, stiffer and stronger, but still short of the comparable carbon. The CSM is stiffer yet, but only because it's 50% thicker due to the chaotic mat of short fibres and the extra 20 grams of resin needed to laminate it. Might look like a win, it's not. This will be far weaker than the two woven glasses. I told you the single plier negra failed to get a measurement, so the zero here is a DNF. 
Then the 2, 4, 6 and 8 plies of Anegra, the fabric with the lowest modulus. You may be wondering why on earth these are so stiff. In fact, the 30 gram sheet of Anegra is similarly stiff to 46 grams of carbon, the king of high modulus. What's going on? Well, the Anegra sheet is much thicker. In fact, the 57 gram one is 2.5 millimeters thick. The 8 ply one are whopping 4 millimeters. That's as thick as the 4 ply dial in with the foam core. We've entered the complex world of at least four factors having an influence. Resin cures around dry fibres like Enegra, Darlin and Kevlar, whereas glass and carbon fully absorbs the resin. Also, Enegra is super low density, below 0.8 grams per cubic centimetre, which means to say that 1000 GSM of Enegra is a lot thicker than 1000 GSM of carbon at an identical weave pattern. You'd need to construct a bonkers setup to control this test to single variables and with access to fabrics that don't exist. We'd need to test laminates of identical thickness, identical resin uptake and so on but these are real-world, multifactorial results for a multifactorial world. Finally, the pair of plates I made with two thin plies of budget carbon fibre. It may shock you to learn that there are dozens of grades of carbon fibre. You'll notice the 39 gram sheet of epoxy clad carbon is disproportionately floppier than the 46 gram one, and that's down to the grade. It's still stiffer than the e-glass though. Now the polyurethane. It's not very stiff. Over 70 millimetres of droop, although not as much as the equivalent dial-in test. But this is carbon fibre we're talking about. My modulus conclusion is that whilst we do get a good cure here, and you can't visually tell them apart, plus other reports that say polyurethane can properly encapsulate fibres, the composite matrix is not holding the carbon in a manner conducive to stiffness. Remember that composites are weird. Carbon fabric is soft and flexible. Quality cured epoxy resin is also rather flexible. But together, they combine forces to end up strong and stiff. That magic isn't happening here. The polyurethane resin is not a comparable home for the fibres. You can get rigid casting polyurethane resins with similar hardness and lower elongation to break like epoxy, but their other stats aren't as good. I wanted to see if this polyurethane, roughly the hardness of an off-road vehicle tyre, could form a useful composite with carbon. A few more tests to decide. Look at how the resins differ. Epoxy is hard and scratchy. Polyurethane is soft and rubbery. My scratching device here marks the epoxy as the sharp tips of a pair of scissors enough so as to leave a groove in the surface you can feel and create dust that can be swept off. Finally, we can get violent. One straightforward impact and the carbon epoxy fails locally. It cannot dissipate the energy out wider to absorb impact. Same test with the polyurethane one. It's much harder to scratch the surface. It does mark, but less noticeably. Given the rubberiness, it's remarkably abrasion resistant. And for the impact, well, I can't make a hole in it. This is interesting. If it really was a super weak rubber with fabric merely draped within it, you'd expect the hammer to almost pass straight through, exposing a tangle of visible fibres. But no, the laminate remains coherent, and there's no sign anywhere of the impacts. The polyurethane has distributed the energy. But the behaviour of the sheet is totally different. I can actually feel my own fingers pushing from the other side, and you can roll it into a much, much tighter sausage than the epoxy one would manage. But not uniformly, you get latitudinal creases as you go. It does return roughly back into a flat sheet again, but there's clearly been internal damage. Rather quietly, no cracking sound. These views are really just to give you more of a sense about what it's like to handle, and with the creasing I was talking about, and to show you that you absolutely cannot twist or rip it to failure using manual hand power, but it cuts easily with exceptionally poor quality paper scissors. You'd need shears to cut the epoxy version. I'm now bending both to failure and microphone them both up so you can hear the progressive stages of snapping. Where are the slow-mo guys when you need them? We now have two smaller sheets. I can barely even get the polyurethane sheet to fold in half. It's all that random creasing that appears wherever it fancies. That hard fold back doesn't do the job and I keep trying. Eventually I need to fold it back on itself the other way and after that I can rip it across with ease. But only if you fold it back both ways. It won't rip unless you do that. The failed edges are very different. The epoxy sheet snaps almost like it was sliced in a guillotine, straight and dangerously sharp. The polyurethane break is a little more complex. The resin isn't incarcerating the fibres so strictly that the two almost become one entity. Instead, the fibres are snapping a few millimetres away from the resin break line. They are not dry fibres though, as you would have seen with Kevlar set in any sort of resin. So the polyurethane resin is forming a proper laminate matrix around the fabric. 
Goodness, we've seen a lot here. Spoiler, I never actually anticipated swapping out epoxy for polyurethane for structural parts. For one matter, they have pot lives of somewhere between two and five minutes, which would be impossible for large layups. But I was, and I remain, interested in fiber reinforced castings of polyurethane for these very clever wheel tires that the burner class of vehicles will have. Very tough, very flexible. I like it. We could even use orange pigment too. Just one of my musings as I headed back across the bridge many hours later. But I have more for you. What the Bernard is that? Both good people and bad people of the channel. Buried somewhere under this blancmange of expanding polyurethane foam are those specially cut uh, MDF forms for the shape of the sledge, which is buried somewhere under here. Now this was the quickest and lowest cost method I could think of, of filling in all the gaps. Uh, you could have used very, very expensive modeling foam, which is uh, I know it looks a lot lot smarter, um, at least at this stage, but it is genuinely as expensive as uh, the actual end result of the, uh, of the part, which strikes me as slightly um, bizarre. So we've gone for this. Um, I will find out in due course whether that was a terrible choice or whether it was absolute genius. Probably somewhere in the middle, tending towards the genius end. Anyway, I'm now going to cut away the main bits which have just expanded too far using exceptionally high-tech equipment you can tell i've not used this saw for forever um, probably two or three years anyway that has survived all of alan's moves around the country and i don't think i ever used it anyway i have a saw and then i will tidy the whole thing up with the, with the sander with the electric sander and see what goes on buried in here are loads of offcuts of um sort of poured two-part polyurethane as well it's not just the um the expanding stuff i just wanted to use up loads of odds and ends that i had lying around at the back of the uh the storage area right let's get on with it all of the basic cutting to begin with i'll save the scrap foam once again for a potential third round of recycling in a future project of i have no idea what before long and without accidentally cutting away too much i have something that looks a bit more like the shape of an upturned shell of a one-third scale bernard body the nose actually needed to be made on another baseboard as the large one was too short, but that's fine. A little more manageable in fact. I won't lie, using cheap moisture cure expanding foam has downsides. There were air bubbles, and indeed actual voids, despite the careful slow spraying technique I'd used. This meant I had to go around the cured shape again with shameful remedial foam spraying to minimise the undulations. The name of the game here is low cost. I want this plug, or pattern, or male mould, or positive mould, to cost me less than £100. You may be able to guess why when you consider this is only a one-third scale of the real thing. I attached the nose with some of the more expensive Sudal 2K chemical cure foam with better adhesion, and Orbital sanded the whole thing down to a reasonable finish. You could then use filler or fairing compound over the whole thing, but I'm not. Instead I wrapped it in a shrink wrap, or what yacht over in Freedomland call saran wrap, and then I did a skin over the top of glass fibre in some epoxy resin that was about to expire. My hope is that this will give me a functioning mould from which to create a part. Yes, direct from the pattern. I will cover why and all the shape and size choices behind the prototype in the next video where I actually do the proper lamination of the part. You can hurl any assorted abuse at me in the meantime, but I'll try and pacify you with some nice evening shots over the yard, including, yes, one of the resident cousins of Alan the lifeboat. Bye.